So uh, I'm delighted to be able to talk to Mark Thompson, who for the last five years has been the Glenfiddich Grand Ambassador. Uh, <laughs> the Grand Ambassador. Would you prefer to be the Grand Ambassador? Uh, it sounds very uh, uh, clan-like, so perhaps not. That's like the Grand Wizard, isn't it? <laughs> I'll dial that back. Um, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be able to talk to Mark Thompson, who for the last five years has been the Glenfiddich brand ambassador. Wow, okay. The Glenfiddich brand ambassador to the UK. Now, traveling the UK extensively and internationally, presenting Scotland's largest single malt scotch, leading single malt scotch. Uh, tell me, Mark, is this the first time you've slowed down in five years? I, I think I've actually sped up a little bit, Sam. Uh, it, it's it's a really strange situation because I think ordinarily as an ambassador, your time is split very much between uh, events, public speaking, hosting dinners, and so on and so forth, which typically take place mm. in the evenings. And your day may be filled with some bartender trainings or some individual trainings or or, or pickups, but currently it seems it's falling more into a nine to five position because you're, it's a directive coming through from the offices. So weirdly, I'm slightly busier during the day, but I just have nothing to do at night. So it's, it's actually been quite a difficult transition because mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm up earlier, working harder from you know, half eight till six o'clock at night and then thinking, well, this is me just waking up now, not, you know, not waking up, but getting ready to head out. So it's, it's been quite strange. It's, it's certainly the travels. It's nice not to be traveling because that can be very taxing. But equally, the constant diary invitations for Skype meetings, uh, aside from yourself, obviously, <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> uh, have been have been nonstop. Oh. Well, I find that, yeah, keeping a routine is um, it's actually been quite important. And uh, while we're still allowed to head out for a little bit, uh, I do try and simulate my commute, um, just sort of take a little wander around, get some oxygen in my brain before I start for the day. Have you got um, any nice walks around you there? Well, I'm a, I'm a runner and I'm in the centre of Edinburgh. So uh, super, very lucky, very, very green city and not that big a city either. Mm. Uh, it's uh, peppered throughout our, our summit. It's, it's quite a hilly uh, layout. So throwing the trainers on, I'm four minutes from Christophan Hill, which is beautiful and will elevate you above the entire city to be able to see out into the countryside and across mm -hmm. to Arthur's Seat and over to the sea. So there's some fabulous bits for wandering around and um, getting that breath of fresh air. Ah, oh, wonderful. Well, as I say, we, we, we can go out for now, but um, it's possible that, you know, well, we are supposed to be keeping uh, home as much as possible. Um, now, when the, when the lockdown did start, I imagine that there were some whiskies that were already there with you. So what whiskies did you end up getting locked in with? Uh, <laughs> so I typically have around about 120 open bottles at any one time of lots of different brands. As you can see around me, this is my little office, my kind of working office. So uh, I keep a lot of the sample stock that I would be using or utilizing for trainings here. So if, if it, was, it wasn't a mad scramble, I certainly, um, yeah, I think I'd probably, if I'd opened my doors to invite a few in for a, a lock in here, they would have been quite happy. Uh, but, it, you know, I tend to not, my girlfriend said last night, we opened something, well, it was already opened. We'd opened up a, a bottle of Glenfiddich 26 year old. And she commented, and I suppose people think just because you've got it at home, that's what you're going to be drinking. And she mm. said, oh, has it got to that stage where we're having the really good stuff? Mm. Uh, and I said to her, no, no, it's, uh, there's not enough in that bottle to go out to trade with. It's, it's you know, there's 100 ml, so I might as well. it's been a while since I've actually had it. It's quite surprising, even although you have all the choice, you start becoming a little bit selective. And right, yeah. perhaps eking it out. A little bit, mm. you know. Um, we've no yeah. chocolate left. In. We ate all that in the first week, although we had enough to probably get us through a month. But just because that was there, we ate all that. <laughs> but I think the whiskey is a completely different thing. We tend to take our time with it mm. and end up with loads of bottles with about two fingers left in them. Yeah, well, I started about a year ago an infinity bottle. In fact, Ed has some of it. I gave it to him as a oh, gift. Nice. 
and there's been a few people that I've known with infinity bottles, which is basically once it gets down to a level, uh, you know, of 50 mils or something, then you're going to let it go. Yeah. Uh, either drink it, and what I've started to do is put it into a, an empty bottle, and just it, that bottle constantly develops, mm-hmm. and it will fill up, and then you'll take a few drams out, and you'll top it up with something different. Now, sometimes you have a dram of it and think, oh "My goodness, this is incredible!" Yeah. And then you put something in it, and it completely takes that characteristic away. But you know, the past few times, I'm quite careful of. I don't tend to put peated whiskies in it. I have a separate bottle for peated ah, whiskies. Right. So it's just um, single malts, typically, with, uh, with no smokiness in them. Mm. And that's, that, that's, that keeps me going. That keeps those, all those empty bottles ticking over, so to speak. Yeah, and lets you create something new while, uh, while you're not getting any new stuff. But exactly. yeah, I, like the, I like the whiskey bottle, kind of um, the infinity bottle philosophy as well it also means that you never permanently have to say goodbye to anything because you can kind of homeopathically have a few molecules of your favorite whiskey hanging out in there there you go mm-hmm. there you go yeah um so you said that traveling can be you know quite a hassle especially if you're doing a lot of it but you know um you may be wistful for uh, a few places that you might have traveled to this year is there anywhere uh, that you particularly miss any country you'd uh, basically go out to uh, as soon as you can. Do you know the? That's a great question because last year I had the opportunity to travel quite a bit. We had a couple of new products launch, uh, Grand Cru launched last year, so I, I helped and aided the, the wider business in places like Lagos, Nigeria, which was incredible to head out to, incredible place, and go to Belgium quite a lot, which is fun as well uh but you know coming back to scott i lived in london for 16 years before mm-hmm. moving back up here two and a half years ago and i think right now if so, that that question right now it's not about a country i'd go to i would head into the highlands I, i'd mm-hmm. be straight up into uh, a friend of mine runs a great place up in uh, near oban port appen the pier house there i'd be straight up there it's on the beach beautiful hotel restaurant mm. um and you know the, or torridon house get up towards the north coast 500 into i love hill walking so you know that's what i'm missing uh and luckily with this job you get an opportunity to you know travel to places that perhaps are off the beaten track not so much a different country but just a part of your own country that you're like i have not been here for years or never been here and you know you'll do a bit of work and do some work in that area but i always try and make a couple of hours of recreational time to run up a mountain or go for a open water swim or just do something that just gets you back into that the nature of everything Mm. and so i think that's the first thing i'm doing i think when this all returns to whatever normality that will be is get up into the wilds again yeah with a with a whiskey in hand obviously well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the main advantages of um, traveling through Scotland, apart from the fact some of the most stunning scenery in the world we've got here, but also the fact you're never too far away from a distillery if you want to just cram in a little distillery visit at the same time. But, you know, I mean, Scotland, we've been doing it for a very long time, Ireland as well, but there are new places that are getting involved in whiskey making. Japan's had a lot of success, notably. Uh, Australian whiskey is uh, really well regarded as well. But are there any countries that you are keeping your eye on when it comes to uh, making their own whiskey, new emerging <coughs> creators? Uh, last year at the whiskey show in London, the Israeli distillers, Milk and Honey, um, is it, is it, it's, yes, it's really. Um, yes, so. Hmm. Fabulous. And really fun attitude. Just a sort of, was it a pomegranate cask finish they did or something along those lines? It's just, just fun. And like for me, really sugary pomegranate syrups. Well, yeah, yeah. Or it was the pomegranate wine cask. Oh, okay. Pomegranate wine. Uh, and yeah, just things like that where you suddenly go, yeah, okay, that, that's, that's really tasty. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I've been in the whiskey industry long enough to see that. I remember, you know, 11 years ago watching the English whiskey come out. Mm. And uh, the, the head distiller, there's a good friend of mine. And what, you know, Standing beside him at a stand for an hour at a whiskey show, the comments were quite 
terrible. I, I didn't know how he managed to stay a whole weekend mm. because people then were automatically assuming that, well, it's not as good as Scotch. I'm like, well, it's because you're comparing it to Scotch at 10 or 12 years old, and this is three years. And therefore, if you don't have the open-mindedness to embrace this and know that it's well-made and well-intended, it just hasn't had the grace and ability to, to extend its life into you know, double digits. Mm. Uh, and, and of course now, the whole world has changed its attitude in there. And you see some very young products coming to the market with exceptional characteristics. You mentioned Japanese. If you look at things like Chichibu, mm. goodness, look, the, look at how people are going crazy for four, five, six-year-old spirit out of Chichibu. Yeah. And yet years ago, if it was Japanese, it was frowned upon completely. And if it wasn't a 10-year-old, there was no point in drinking it. So I'm so, I'm, I love the fact that these newer countries are, not newer countries, newer producers, are embracing the same attitude the Scots had 400 years ago mm. of just going, let's just try it and see what happens. You know, we keep thinking that we created whiskey. We didn't. It was, you know, centuries before we ever got our grubby little farming paws on it. But <laughs> the, the, you know, if you think back to that very rudimental time of farmers just creating what they could and it not traveling, so not having. Um, a thousand people comment on it it had 30 people in a community going i like your stuff it's good i don't know why i like it but it's not you know and out of that we've got this thing a return to that almost where people are just saying i like it it tastes good mm. and they're not where it came from or how old it is they're just saying that this is something i like yeah. so it's a time for all we guess yeah yeah it's a very very healthy time for to be in the whiskey industry and to be a new producer mm. a far easier time i think than david fit had 10 years ago with english whiskey company mm. so and it's, it's it's often like also the stories behind whiskey that kind of help scotch along we've got 500 years of history to lean on when it comes to telling stories but um going back to japanese whiskey briefly they recently had a success in japan uh, a daytime tv i think it was drama about um masataka takatsuru and his scottish wife rita cowan and their quest to open the first distillery, first malt whiskey distillery in Japan. And so clearly people are hungry for these kind of stories. In Scotland, if you were to direct a TV show about some part of whiskey's history or focus on some of the characters who have brought it to where it is, um, can you pitch that show at me? Oh, goodness. Well, I suppose, you, I suppose interestingly enough, and from a, from a point of view, it might, from a single malt ambassador, it might seem strange, but I'd look at something like the Ushers and the Hayes and the Steins, so the blending families and the Walkers, um, because, oh, actually, well, that's made me think. I, no one's actually uh, put anything together about the Pattisons. Okay. Now, there's, there's a story that could be written today for history. You know, so here's two brothers that um, are marketeers and distributors of whiskey, predominantly into America, and are spending huge amounts of money, and, and, and rightly so, on advertising and marketing, way more than anybody else, and living the playboy lifestyle. Hmm. Um, but eventually, you know, writing checks that their bank can't cash, and the whole thing collapses, and almost almost brings the whiskey industry as we knew it back then to an end. And if it wasn't for the fact that a few other distillers, William Grant included, didn't rely on the Pattisons as their only route to market, they survived. And there's a few examples of other distilleries that, that, um, that managed to survive by that as well. Uh, so yeah, it's a wonderful time in the period of, of you've got phylloxera hitting um, Europe as well. So, you know, the phylloxera bug hitting the French vineyards, the Pattisons crashing and pulling half the whiskey industry down with them. Hmm. And then just as we all recover 15 years later, Prohibition. So yeah. it's, a, it's, you know, within that sort of 30 year span there is a fabulous, interesting social history uh, from a marketing point of view, how people started to develop marketing and whiskey and talking about this product and getting out to the masses. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, 
I, th- I would watch that. That's you've got you've got hardships to overcome. You've got three very distinct seasons. You know, both human, biological, and uh, economic enemies. Yeah, that sounds like that would. Um, I'm sure there was a bit of double crossing and underhanded stuff as well. No doubt. Like picky, picky blinders on whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a that's a strong pitch. I would uh, I would watch that. Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, there's a question in my script that I'm very happy to see that you um, uh, did not delete. So I'm going to launch into it. Um, as a brand ambassador, you uh, as you say do a lot of work in the evenings. You are it's a very social job, um, kind of entertaining and informing groups of people. Now, do you have any talents or party tricks that are going underused in this time of social isolation? And would you like to give us a little performance now? Uh, the only thing that, well, I suppose it's not underused, it, it gets used every year, is the Address to the Haggis, which oh, yeah. um, I learned off by heart a few years ago after being to a number of Burns suppers and sitting with, almost with my, you know, politely with one ear closed towards the speaker so I couldn't hear them tear this wonderful bit of prose apart. Um, and being a whiskey ambassador, it was a very lucrative time when I worked for myself. I was able to host burn suppers, do a proper whiskey tasting, yeah. and do the address of the haggis. So kind of, uh, they were going to t- pay two people separately. I just took both wages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I won't do the whole thing. Um, we're a few months down the line and it's off to spur. But um, favorite lines in the house. <laughs> yeah, um, fair for your honest son, say face. Great chieftain of the pudding race. Upon them are, you tack your place, pinch, tripe or thera, wail, and you're worthy of a grace as langs my erum. That's the first verse. So it's, mm. it's about nine verses long. Um, so yeah, maybe not underused, <laughs> but it's just a shame you can only do it once a year. <laughs> True, but that does, that, does, that does keep it special. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Enjoy it. I am thinking about trying to recite Tam O'Shanter. Mm-hmm. But that's, I think, 25 verses long. Wow. So it's, that's I, I, did, not a... I, I did see that this year, um, Burns Night and um, the Chinese Year of the Rat overlapped. So um, someone had, uh, had translated into Chinese. Oh, what's the, what's the piece called now? Um, the one with the, with the Timorous Beastie in it. Uh... Uh, oh, um... <laughs> that one. <laughs> In your, in your house. Oh, I can't remember the title of it. Uh, interesting, anyway. I'm, I'm yeah, sure this is not making the cut, obviously. But <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's seeing that done into Chinese, so you can sort of get um, these two sort of traditions overlapping. I, I really hope to see more of that. Yeah, I went to, to first when I first started to rest, try to recite the uh, the address. I actually translated it just into English. Because mm. it's old Scott, so so many of the words are completely unused. And mm. by translating it back into English, I was able to see the structure and the story a little bit easier, so it's sunk in. So even when I do sometimes get stuck, or when you know you know something off by heart so well, you can start to change the words and still stay on track. Mm-hmm. So I had a burn supper once where um, the chef forgot to keep a haggis whole for the actual address. Oh, it was already... Opened. It's all plated. It's all plated, and it's all, it's going out. And I said, right, well, what have you got? And he, and he said, I've got a tin of haggis, <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, and a can opener. So there's a line that says, "His knife see rustic labour death and cuts you up with any slack." Uh, and I changed it as I was running through. In fact, I, I, I'd said, um, "For for your honest aluminium clad face," <laughs> uh, and his, you know, his can opener. See, tins have been tossed aside and opened you up slowly without cutting his own hand and then all oh, with a glorious set. So when you, you know when you've got it off pat and when you can start to change and chop the words around. But uh, yeah, getting it into English is the way to do it first and then you can have fun with it. That is fantastic. 